Talking Tudes, and we're here with the one, the only Leonard Harvey, and uh, otherwise known as Steve James from the MUS days. But uh, hey, he is here. You? He is the. You, you don't know this yet, but you are the very first person to use my outside studio. Wow, I love it. It's so, right here in the garage. Right here in the garage. It's yeah. beautiful. It got to hear really the, is, the car noise going behind you. Yeah, I and, love it. I, yeah. I, I, the it's like dog we're doing, was barking earlier. I, I know. That'd be kind of cool. It's in the like, background. It's like we're doing an outside remote, you know. Oh, this is fun. Yeah. This is fun. Bring yeah. back the real remote days. I was I was sitting here talking to the boatman earlier on the phone, but anyway, I was sitting here watching a turtle make its way across the driveway oh, here. <laughs> that's great. That's great, you know. Yeah, I mean, so you don't it was have entertaining. To do that inside a radio. That's space. right. That's right. You How have many to... turtles have you ever seen walk across the? I know. Studio floor, especially when you're high atop the towers. You know, that's, I, that's right. On the yeah. third floor. Yeah, <laughs> Though I do actually like that setup very yeah, much. Oh yeah, so do I. I think it looks really cool. Oh yeah. And well, I, like I say, that setup was the we were on the fifth floor back in the uh, oldies FM when they first were were started. Yeah. With Randy Crow. That's okay. where he was. He was okay. in the park row on the fifth floor. Was that WLCS? L- WLCS, yeah. And then we love Crow Station. Yeah, which we found out. Yeah, yeah I did never I never knew that either. And and when Randy left and Mike Murphy and Vandermine took over, yeah. that's when I got hired over there and I was over there with Bill Marshall. Okay. And it was right there on the top and they had those turn the turn pot. You know, oh, mixer and the, the whole thing. Stuff. Oh yeah. yeah. Well, it was an oldie station, I guess, so they had to have that. But they had the the yeah. Denon CD players that never worked right. But anyway, yeah, sounds yeah. fun. A lot of years fun. ago. So, how have you been doing? I mean, through this whole COVID nineteen experience, uh, you and <laughs> you and the wife handling all this okay? Uh, we've had our moments, but yeah, <laughs> it's it's been it's been okay. We've been. We've been making it through. You know, we get out once in a while. We also always go out and see the sunset and, you know, that kind of something to break up the night. And, you know, going to the store is kind of a, at first was pretty scary. Now it's getting kind of, yeah, yeah getting kind of normal. Just wear your mask. You know? Yeah, yeah. If you're, uh, I, I had to laugh today. I filled up my uh, gas tank for the third time. Yeah, in since like this. like two or three yeah, months, yeah, right? Yeah, I mean, it's just right. crazy. And. Basically, I just had to go in and pay for the gas, pump it in my car, go get the change. So I thought, well, I'm not going to throw on the mask. You know, I'm only in there for like 10 seconds and I'm out, right? Yeah. And everybody's got a mask on. Yeah. At the convenience store. And I'm feeling like, oh, I probably should have worn that. Now, if Noreen hears that I did this, she'll be really ticked because she works, my, my Noreen, works for the fire department. Okay. And so she has all these protocols she has to follow. That so that because she's an essential worker, so she has to, you know, <laughs> all this has to be uh, kept, you know, safe. And so I should never do that, but yeah, I'll have to start wearing masks more. I always do in the grocery store, yeah, I generally do any place that you get out in public in a building. I always do. So why I don't, why I didn't do it there, I suppose I just thought I'd be so quick. But of course, how you long did, does it take? Right? You did distancing though, were you six yes, foot? Yes, I did. Yeah. I didn't get closer than six foot to anybody. Yeah, so, so yeah. that's always how helpful. All the I, coughing I did got people kind of got concerned <laughs> about. But uh, other than that, you yeah. know, I uh, yeah. had to laugh. You know, speaking of my sweet Noreen, I had to laugh. We were We were talking last night. Her father was a state policeman, a Michigan state policeman for like 35 years. And they lived all over Michigan. She okay. lived up in the UP and Wakefield near the far western part of the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. She lived down in Detroit, I mean, you know, Flint area. I mean, they, they were literally all over the state And when she was a kid, she and her brother. And last night she brought up something that her dad used to say, and I'd never heard this, but he said that if you ran across someone who you thought was real, let's say they're, they weren't real sharp, okay? <laughs> That's the sharpest they snipe in the drawer. They refer to them as a Clyde suck finger, <laughs> okay? Okay. Uh, and and I, I'd never heard this expression, and I thought, we were laughing because we were like, Clyde Suckfinger. I've never heard that. <laughs> and I thought, first of all, being an old radio guy, I thought, wouldn't that have made a great radio name? <laughs> yeah. You know? 
Yeah. You know, take the ride with Clyde afternoons. <laughs> Clyde Suckfinger on the radio. Yeah. You know? So I thought that would have been great, right? But uh, but anyway, uh, I started thinking, well, there's got to be an origin to this because I'm a baby boomer, but was this like a WW2 generational word? And it turns out it really is. Okay. It's a term. Basically, it, it implies you're kind of a joker, a silly joker, yeah, not too sharp, you know. Okay. And uh, there was a apparently a famous World War II pilot whose first name was Clyde, and his handle was Suckfinger, <laughs> and his last name, whatever it was. But anyway, I just thought, I've never heard that before. Yeah. Have you? Had no, you? never. Yeah. Never. Thought, but that would that, be a great radio oh, name, wouldn't that it? That would have been fabulous. Just think where our careers would have gone. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we could have had We'd a, be right up there with Howard Stern. Oh, and yeah, yeah. yeah. In fact, Howard Stern should have had that name. Oh, yeah. It would have been great Howard for Suckfinger. Him. It's funny you mentioned that because when I started thinking about this in terms of a radio name, I thought this would be a great name. For Howard Stern. Yeah, yeah. He would have been able to, you know, that would have just so fit his his career, his his uh, demeanor, his mentality in that program. Yeah, yeah. Would have been great. Suckfinger you know? would be perfect for that. Oh, yeah, wouldn't yeah. that be great? Yeah. Anyway, so you I know, thought that was hilarious. I know, promised Noreen I'd mention it on the radio. You know, the uh, the one thing that really brought to mind for me, too, is when I was when I was a kid, I was watching the Flintstones. Yeah. And, you know, Flintstones, what, in the 60s, maybe? Yeah. Early oh, yeah. 60s? Yeah. And uh, I remember Fred going into a, like a jazz bar or something like that. And they all, they all were saying, I'm hip, I'm hip. And I'm thinking, in the 70s, I thought that was us, man. I thought that was, it was us that said, I'm hip. Right. But, but yeah. it was like way back. So it was well, that. actually, uh, hipster, doesn't that term actually come back from like the early 50s? 50s, yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. because um, there, was a, there was a group that were looking at things a little differently and of course, then you got the advent of Elvis and rock and roll, and right. you got the term rock and roll, and and all of that starts to really hit in the fifties. So. Well, let me, let me ask you this because this has been my question for the last for Don Anderson, for Paul, for, for myself, since you know Little Richard died not too long ago. Yeah, and he always claimed to be the king of rock and roll, and uh, of course Elvis was considered the king of rock and roll, and I but I always considered Chuck Berry as the king of rock and roll. Who, who do you feel is the king of rock and well, roll? Well, growing up, I always thought Elvis, uh, personally, I always thought Elvis was the man. Now, that's not to take away from Little Richard, because Little Richard's influence affected the Stones, the Beatles. Right. Most of the uh, 60s rock bands, if you will, or pop rock bands, really, uh, in the from about 63 through whatever, those groups... If you talk to them, most of them will say Little Richard was an early influence. Right. And it really kind of makes sense. What we forget is a lot of the people that were producing hit pop rock in the early 60s were born in the 30s. Okay. okay? Yeah. I mean, when you really think about yeah. it. Yeah. <clears throat> so as a result, here's this guy that just comes out and knocks the socks off the world, right? Little Richard. Right. And just blows everybody away. This guy's doing stuff they've never heard, and he's just, man, he's on another planet. And, of course, Elvis took off from that. A whole bunch of people took off. Right. So I would agree. I mean, I, I just think that he played the role. But for me, if I thought about it, Growing up, I always thought it was Elvis because Elvis was the high profile guy. Yeah, he was a high profile guy, but he got most of his influence though from going to gospel churches too. I mean, right. a lot of you know, right. m mainly well, black gospel churches. You so. know, and that's kind of Little Richard too was was the gospel church. You absolutely, know? and and if you Hank Williams, you know, remember I played country oh, yeah. on the radio all those years. Hank Williams Senior got most of what he picked up musically. They said watching black performers at nightclubs when he was a kid yeah down south and and he if the thing that made hank williams so unique i thought was he had this soulful feel to his songs the stuff he wrote was right. from the heart right and he was an amazing uh he had this amazing sense of soul about him but I think it was because that was his orientation to the music right. that he then took and translated into country. So he took that gospel feel, that jazz feel, and took it into a country 
sense and then had all this soulful feel in which the the listener thought wow this guy's really in touch right right and, well and you hear that all the time you know i always thought to say this I, I went to cleveland to see the bob dylan exhibit uh when he was when they did a at the rock and roll hall of fame okay right yeah and the thing that struck me about that i walked out of there a good friend of mine sandy and i she lives in la but uh we came out of that exhibit and we both went wow Bob Dylan. I just didn't realize what he did was he fused, uh, 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 what folk. It was the music he played? Folk music, uh, folk music into yeah. rock music, right? right? Or pop music, really? Yeah. But he made it work. Yeah. And and he had brilliant lyrics, and so the result was that it was all about timing. The question I always had: if he was two years earlier or two years later. Would we have ever heard of Bob Dylan? Right. He couldn't sing. No. The guy had a no. terrible singing yeah, voice. Yeah. But and and the other Who, thing. Who Bob? Is, Bob Dylan. Yeah, come on. Well, you, if you <laughs> and I lived up in Duluth, Minnesota, as you know, mm. for thirty years, uh, after growing up in Southern Michigan, and the thing that struck me is Bob Dylan was from forty miles north of Duluth. He grew up in Hibbing. Right. So, it's not surprising when you hear Bob talk. Right, you've got what they call bohunks that live up in the Iron Range, <laughs> Bohemian Hungarians. Okay. Right. They call them bohunks. Yeah, and they were miners. They were tough people. That was all U.S. steel mining up there, and it was. Uh, it's not surprising. Bob was a product of that, of of where he grew up. Right. part of how he talked, but but his musical lyrics were amazing. But what people don't realize about Bob Dylan, I think is he was a prolific songwriter. Right. He wrote thousands and thousands of songs. You hear a handful of them right. that are legendary, but, I mean, he, he figured out where was the money. Right. The I mean, money was writing the and, and that's the thing about it is, too. I think a lot of people put Bob Dylan up there on a pedestal as far as saying that he wrote all these anti-war songs and all this peace songs and everything. He just wrote what was going to make, make him some money, I think, you know, as far as Bob Dylan was concerned, because we, there was a documentary on him that I watched and it was pretty boring, but it was, it was about Bob Dylan. And, it, and that's kind of what he kept saying. He said, I didn't, I didn't really do anything to think that I was doing anything special I was just writing stuff that I thought was uh, was good stuff and would sell on the on the radio, you know. Well, I always laughed in Duluth. He was actually born in Duluth, but he grew up in Hibbing. Yeah, right. He was born in a hospital in Duluth. Um, he for years, people were like the Duluthians and Minnesotans. Why doesn't he go back to his town of birth to perform? Yeah. Well, when he finally does, and I went to that concert, there was. Uh, Bob Dylan and Paul Simon were at okay. this concert. It was an outdoor concert at a place called Bayfront Park, which is right where Lake Superior meets St. Louis Bay at the at their iconic lift bridge, blah, blah, blah. The 20,000 people showed up for that concert, right. right? But prior to him doing that, there was no venue, no way to do a concert that size. Which means he couldn't have made any real money. When they finally could make it a big time profitable show, right? He shows up and everybody's like, Oh, he finally came home. Yeah. Well, you finally got a venue big enough where he could make some money. <laughs> this isn't a big shocker. The big the big thing that this documentary was talking about was when he did do his switch over from folk music to to uh, pop music, I like guess you could say. Lady Lay with the guitars. Yeah, and yeah, the until, into yeah. going to the band, basically. He used the band. Yeah. And um, when he did it, went electric, I guess is what you'd yeah, say. And they, they were upset. And, and they Ooh. booed him, man. They just yes, booed they him. Did. They just thought it was just a horrible thing that he was doing, this electric music. Yeah. But the one story that, that did kind of interest me was that when he first started out, before he started writing music and everything, he uh, went to a friend's house, and his friend had a bunch of the old... Uh, Oh, what some of the folk singers, uh, Woody, Woody Guthrie and, oh, yeah. and, and 
well, you know, a bunch of the folk folk people that were doing right. the stuff. Well, Peter, and he, Paul, and Mary, were they singing by then? No, 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 no. This is before that. This is before that? Yeah, because they basically sang his stuff. But anyway, yeah, yeah so anyway, he stole all these records from his friend. <laughs> It's like 400 oh, records oh, really? of all this folk music, yeah. of all these old folk singers like Woody Guthrie and and uh, I can't much remember the other guy, but uh, and that's where he kind of got his his understanding of folk music. He yeah. said so. It's like it wasn't even original, you know. I'm thinking here's this guy because I love Bob Dylan, yeah. I love his music, yeah. but the guy wasn't really even original. He just kind of stole the stuff and kind of said, okay, well I can write this and we can do it this way, and you know. Anyway, oh, he was just like her. Remember her, Hurricane uh, Carter, when he wrote that song about the fighter. You know, I don't. Okay, he wrote a song about a fighter, and uh, the the fighter supposedly got um, thrown in jail for something he didn't do. And anyway, he actually got this guy a new trial <laughs> to go oh, out again from the wow. song. Okay, and they still found him guilty. But anyway, <laughs> Did they really? No, I don't know. I don't know. I didn't follow it that closely, but. I laugh, uh, you know, every once in a while someone would claim they'd see Bob in Duluth. Yeah. That somebody said uh, this guy had a car was stuck trying to go up one of the hills in the winter. Somebody got out of their car because they would do that in Duluth. Yeah. Pile up there, start pushing the car, and they go, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> they heard out the window as he kept going. It was like, okay, they're pretty sure that's who it was. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. But anyway. Not to get off on a tangent about Bob. But. Yeah. Well, that yeah. I don't. I, I don't even know where how we got off on a tangent about Bob. But that, I that's fine. It's my fault. No, that's fine. We were I, talking about music, and it led to yeah. Because yeah. I do. I do like Bob Dylan. He yeah. was one of my favorites, and that was a, a friend of mine from back in the Mount Clemens days that used to play it on a track. Bob Dylan. And it was like I got hooked on Bob Dylan. She played uh, Jeff Tall. I got hooked on Jeff Tall. Oh yeah. Yeah, so oh, it was a lot of gosh. lot of good music back in that, you know. So I I love the '60s era. Well, speaking of that, I should mention you and I talked about this. So I wanted to clear it with you before we did it. Was that uh, our friends over at Real Oldies, WGVU 1480 and 850 oh, yeah. AM, yeah. Uh, are holding their annual auction or auction uh, fundraiser. Fundraiser, yeah. Yeah, and and here's the thing. Long story short, the only reason it's relevant is normally. People like Tim Actorhoff, myself, a bunch of people. Don um, Anderson, I know, Don gets asked Anderson all the time. Don Anderson gets invited all the yeah. time, a bunch of people. Uh, get invited to come over and be on the air for I, I never do because I was fired from there. But anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you should go anyway. Yeah, Next I should. Next time I go, you should go with Yeah, oh, there we go. Yeah. Like, what are you going to do? Yeah, because I was program director there for three years. So, yeah, yeah they, anyway. It would be cool. Yeah. You should do it. That'd well, Alette is no longer there. He's the one that wanted to get rid of me. So, there you go. I can Bob go. Mason, talk to him, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, normally we'd be on the radio talking about that, and we're not. So they're doing it this week, minus the old radio personalities that would yeah. normally be on. Well, let me let me tell you about back up about that, which is kind of funny. Um, Ken Colby, I, I guess he likes me. I don't know. Who knows? But I did the show Motown and Soul Party for ten years over there, and uh, also. Uh, it was a jazz show that I did. It was called a, uh, kind of a light jazz show that I used to do over there called uh, Smooth Flavors. Yep. And I did that for about eight years over there. And I, I didn't even work there, okay. you know. And But yet I got canned from there. So it was like, what, was I the, the, the dumb minute, one or wait, were wait. they the dumb ones? Oscar, are you saying to me that you worked in media and got canned from somewhere? Well, yeah, I got, yeah. Well, I didn't really get, I mean, I didn't really who, get canned. I really didn't get hired back is what it was. Who, who I, I quit and then I didn't get hired back. canned from anywhere. I know, I know. <laughs> well, but, it, but the thing about it is, am I the idiot, though, that was that did the shows for 10 years and for nothing? And I just, I just love doing the show. So they, well, they played it. I, hey. yeah. It's. Like you and I have always talked about, Oscar, uh, playing radio. Yeah. The fact we got paid for it was really the bonus. remarkable. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was such a fun job and a crazy way to make a dollar. Yeah. And a lot of times you do things that it's like, really? You want me to do this and do this and go there? And it's like, you know, nowadays it's like, nah, I don't think so. I don't, you know, I don't yeah. want to go over there and Pretty do that. Pretty cool. I just saw, who was it? Uh, John Records Landecker. Just got inducted in the NAB, National Association of Broadcasters Hall of Fame. Okay. Just recently. And remember, he did Boogie Check at nights on WLS, the Big 89. Okay. Yeah. All right. And he, um, 
How come you're not in the Hall of Fame? I, I think Don Anderson should be in the Hall of Fame, too. Yeah, absolutely. Tim Akterhoff and, yeah. you know. Well, you know, we've got, a, you know, on our Legends interviews coming up, uh, we got to, when, when we get a chance, we got to interview Harry Brown. Harry Brown, yeah. From WMUS. And Harry, uh, is everybody in Muskegon, I, or not everybody, but a lot of people in Muskegon know Harry Brown. He grew up here. Yeah. And... Uh, and he was on MUS for years. He was a teacher, taught computer programming or that type of thing at the yeah, college which is, which for is, 25 years. Which is one thing Tim talked about, that he came up with a program that they yes. made some lucrative money on. And I'm thinking, did you guys make the lucrative money or did Harry make the lucrative <laughs> money on it? But sounds like Harry did okay in the, in the long run. So well, Harry, was, uh, Harry was an interesting guy because he was so brilliant. And he was so was, still is. He's a yeah. brilliant guy. And he, uh, tremendous talent, has a voice that makes me sound like a little girl. I mean, his voice is amazing. And, you know, he worked at the FM of WLS Chicago for three months, didn't like it, and came home. Yeah. But he was, he was given, they seeked him out. They, they, or sought him out, rather, and asked him to come and be on the air there. So, Mm -hmm. I mean, Harry was big time voice, big time talent. Yeah, just so, just like John Allen. You know, I th- I thought John had a tremendous voice, and he yep. basically did m- mainly the engineering most of the time when he did things. John so. was an engineering genius. Yeah, he truly was. And you know, we talked about this in my interview um, that John was just almost to the point of being neurotic about the audio. Yeah, yeah, but that was <laughs> MUS never sounded better. I thought. Yeah, because but, he was so targeted to make it sound max that sound out well i think i it think was I, amazing i think i've told you the story too when i was at real gold radio and, and doing the radio station over there um john had all these con- these controls and all this stuff that he had put in there i mean i'm electronic technician but i don't know half the stuff that he was using but he had the whole rack just filled with stuff to tweak yeah you know and my knee would bump something and, and he would hear it in his, in his car. He'd come home and he'd say, something isn't right. And he'd come in there and he'd say, Oh, here it is. You must've hit this with your knee. Watch your knees. It's like, <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> you, you hold John in great high oh, regard. High regard. Yeah. 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 I, I he, thought he had a, what a tremendous, like I say, tremendous voice. He was great on the radio. Oh, he was. And as far as the radio station sounded, the, 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 it sounded. It, it never sounded better. John I mean, was I, on ZZM FM, right? I don't know. I don't. I, I don't. thought he was. I thought I heard John in the olden days on ZZM FM. Well, I, I know. I know. Tim told the story that he went to uh, CXT. Him okay. and yeah, and but he came back to MUS, but then he got hired oh, by yeah, Clear Channel. Yeah, yeah and then right. went went to the, there for seven years, and then he retired here, but didn't. Unfortunately, didn't didn't live very long when he came here. So yeah, which what a sad loss. Yeah, I, I still can't believe it. Um, like you and I had talked before, um, I got a chance to talk to him because my partners and I had built a radio station up in northern Wisconsin, mm-hmm. and he had he wanted to compare notes. You know, yeah, from a mar- you know from the sales side because that's really more what I know. I didn't know anything about engineering. I still don't. But uh, you know, John on the it was the flip side of that, obviously. But uh, but he was like, yeah. So you know, tell me about what you did here. And yeah. I said, well, tell me about what you're doing. You know, it was yeah. a great talk. I'm glad we had that chance. Yeah. We hadn't seen each other in years, so that was really nice. Did you get the chance to to hear his format though, too? Or I didn't really. Yeah, because I, I, I mean, it's nothing yeah, like yeah. it is today. I mean, it's the, today is well. I won't even. I won't really go into it because yeah. I don't want to get in trouble. But yeah. I, yeah, his format was was the best format, best oldies format I've ever heard. Yeah. I, I thought. Yeah, well, and I worked at the oldie station for a lot of years, and I think that would he, he had the best the best oldie station around. Oh, yeah. So, oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, he was, uh, you know, it just, like I say, what a sad loss to the industry. Yeah, that I he's think gone. so. Uh, and he was having, I, I gather, he was having a lot of fun with his new radio toy. Oh, yeah. That he was playing with. That but he, he, it stressed him out big time. That's I mean, it I was thought. a lot of work for him, and he, he wanted everything perfect, and... Yep. Unfortunately, <laughs> Cox and I and <laughs> Jim Cox and I and, and some of the other people he hired as far as for sales and stuff, they, they were not perfect, so it kind of yeah. made him crazy. So yeah. a little too much. Well, that's you know unfortunate, like yeah. I said. Just 
That's why everybody does, you know, radio with no jocks anymore <laughs> each day, you know. Well, you know, it is interesting uh, what you can do. Yeah. Uh, you can sound localized, right? Oh, yeah. They can be talking, they can be reading local promos. Yeah. And they're, here they are sitting in a studio in Lord knows what part of the world. Yeah. And uh, who well, knows, you know. Yeah, the one, the one thing I always, I, I think I told you a story too before, is that um, the first automated station that I automated was WKBZ FM 95.3. Okay. And um, I was doing the, the, the mornings, automated the mornings on the FM, and I also did the talk mornings on the AM. Sure. So I got uh, um, cards from women... <laughs> Said, one of them said, it sounds like you're talking to me. <laughs> I'm thinking, I'm not even, I'm not even live. You know, it's, it's, it's all pre-recorded stuff that I got on there. And it's like, wow, well, I guess I did okay. <laughs> I worked at an FM up north where they had a woman who came in and used the, all she did was record a series of liners. Like yeah. 30 liners. Yeah. This is Tracy on 96 Light FM, right? And she had this great voice. And one day we're out at a uh, public relations event, okay. dinner, and sitting with the program director. I was a sales manager of the station, and she was just a talent who sold ads, actually. And the, there were a couple other people sitting at the table we didn't know, and they get talking along. And, and then the general manager mentions, well, you know, she's Tracy. Because the guy goes, I really love this Tracy at yeah, night. Yeah. And she he goes, well, here she is. And the guy about jumped out of his chair and goes, really? I can't believe it. Oh, this is so cool. He was so excited to meet her. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that funny? Oh, yeah. So, but all pre-recorded voice saying the same 30 liners every yeah. day. Oh, yeah. Shows. She yeah. has to ever go there. Yeah. Yeah. But, well, like just like now, we're, we're pre-recording this in my garage. Yeah. It, it'll be on Saturday and it'll sound live. But, yeah, uh, it will. Yeah. But yeah. we're being honest. So. Yeah. Well, hey, you know, I. Uh, well, Saturday, what? I'm not sure. Uh, maybe I'll be at the grocery store, you know, <laughs> with my mask on. Yeah, there you go. Noreen and I, you know. But yeah, you got to keep you got to keep some things light, though. I think right now, so that's one thing about the. That's why I wanted to keep the show going, and I wanted to try to get people that were talking light. It, it, it's it's hard to talk light. I mean, sometimes some people get into it, and it's yeah. it's hard to say stop. No, we don't really want to talk about that because it's what's going on, you know. Oh, exactly. So. Exactly. Well, it's such a unique time. And, yeah, uh, yeah. Of course, you know, the. I don't want to get into any of the politics of it. Right. I, I right. totally Same avoided here. that. I'll tell you what, on Facebook, I decided about six months ago that I was just not going to uh, go there anymore. I don't make any comments politically on Facebook anymore. I just, I just don't want to be in the middle of that anymore. It's. It's just not good, and and I, it, it's for me personally, it's just something I, I just found it becoming more increasingly unhealthy. Yeah, and I thought I don't want to participate in that side of it. I have my views. Everybody has their views. They right. all have their right. We're we're Americans. And that's great. Yeah. Uh, but I thought I I'm trying to remember anyone who ever said I was reading something that I didn't agree with politically on Facebook, and it totally changed my mind. <laughs> That's, like, never been said no, ever. No, Okay? No. So, anyway. But, the, yeah, like, the, like I say, the only thing that really scares me on Facebook is some of this false information that's going out there that yeah. people are actually buying, you know. I agree. So I agree, and it's going to be... And it's hard to tell sometimes. I mean, it, you know, it's just like, uh, you know, buying my uh, kayak for $99. I don't think it's ever going to show up, but that's what it said it was. <laughs> <laughs> it was a great deal. It seemed like it, yeah. Maybe it showed up. You know? Just like my uh, my two terabyte uh, flash drive that I I got and finally in it uh, went to do it. And it was like you get to about eh, I don't know thirty gigs and then it says oh, I can't really do anymore, <laughs> even though it says it's got two terabytes on it. But anyway, you yeah. know it was interesting. I a real quick thing. Uh, was this kind of radio related? Uh, my brother, who is this is going to sound crazy is a Methodist minister up near Traverse City. Okay. Um, he has a very elderly congregation, and he's trying to decide what to do about providing some sort of church service on right. Sundays. Right. So he's been thinking about 
trying to get a, a setup, a, a transmitter, basically, right, right. that would be programmed to the radio for 200 feet. Right. And those are out there, and that's what they use at drive-ins. Right. So I called Bob Moore because I said, I don't know what they use. Of course, Bob Moore knew. Bob's oh, yeah. a brilliant engineer who worked at WCBS New York. So I said, Bob, how does that work? He said, you can read up about it. He said, but here's the thing you got to worry about. Make sure that it is FCC licensed. Yeah. If it is not, they could be fined $10,000. Yeah, yeah. Even though, you know, so he said, don't buy it at some place that they mail it to you. Go to wherever it is and actually buy it. And if you're really smart, hire an engineer to do it and hook it up and do everything. Pay the long dollar. And so I called my brother and said, hey, here's what you do. But I said, if you're going to do this, you're going to regret it. I, you got to get somebody who knows what they're doing. Yeah. Well, I, But it's a great idea. Well, I, I actually had a AM transmitter, and uh, I did give it to a guy who is do, setting it up for his, his church. Mm-hmm. And I haven't heard back from him yet whether it worked or not or whether he still had it or, you know, what's going on with it. But Okay, Oscar, I th- so I'm going to hold you to this now. Well, it's, because, AM, it's an AM transmitter. But so it doesn't matter. AM or FM, they both work. Yeah. The only the, I heard the only risk is that wherever the FM or AM signal is, you don't want it to be too close to interrupt with another to signal. A signal that's in the immediate area, right. or they won't be able to hear it. Right. But I said to Howard, I said, brother, make sure you get somebody that knows what they're doing. Yeah. Or you're gonna. This isn't gonna work. It's a great idea, and it'll work fine if it's done correctly. Well, then I retract that. I didn't give it to him. <laughs> I don't know where he got it. <laughs> but, you know, I guess they can program either FM or AM. Yeah, this one so, would just AM, but yeah. yeah. But they both, I guess, are fine. Yeah, yeah. So I think this cool. one was only like 100, 100 yards or something like that as far as what it would do. So Yeah, well, this was 200 feet. Yeah. So, you know, for an FM. Well, that's maybe that's 100 feet, feet then, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and you don't require an FCC license, which I didn't know. That you were allowed to broadcast anything, yeah, on any sort of. Well, see, device. I could have now. See, I could have had that, and I could have set it up in here, and we could have broadcast to I don't know the deer, the high I school guess. across the, the high school. Street. Yeah, that nobody's at. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, actually, I got my neighbors like six. I don't know about six acres away. I could, you know, we could have broadcast to the bank across the street. I don't know. That would be pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey man, this is fun. It yeah, was fun. Thanks for inviting me. I'm. Uh, it was great. You know, I'm working again. I work part time in the mornings now. Where Monday through Friday? Where I'm at? working for one of Randy Crow's media company. Oh, okay, okay. All yeah. right. I thought you were. I thought you were going to tell me you were on the air somewhere. No, nope, no, nope, not on the radio. Okay. So the only time I get to be on the radio is with you, or if the guys at GBU invite me for their fundraisers <laughs> twice a year. So that's well, you- it. Well, you you already you already heard what I asked you to do. So if you wanted if you want to do it, hey, please please do. So if oh, you got any people that you want to interview or whatever, we can. Oh yeah, that's That'd be great. that's what it's all about. So absolutely. Well, like I said, I'd love to do some more of those legends interviews. I I hope someday uh, that we're able to pick up a few of those. You know, I it's, I thought it would be great, and unfortunately, I was thinking about this the other day for the Muskegon Legend Radio guys. I wish we had some more of the old guys from True. Yeah. Sadly, a lot of them are not here anymore. Right. We well, you know. Meaning I, they're not with this world. I know? got a lot of good. I'll be putting out a one from uh, Don Anderson here real soon, Which and we great. got a lot of we got a lot of pictures. Yep. And he found some pictures of back when he did the uh, Sonny and Cher thing at the beach thing. Oh, that's cool. And uh, so I, I had to transfer them from slides, and so we transferred those, and we got a few other things from the old TRU building. There's one, two pictures he brought me that he that had to do with TRU and their and their uh, uh, septic tank going. It's like, I, <laughs> why do you want to put that out there? You know. Well, you know, you don't. But you get a good picture of the, you know, of TRU. It's like, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> you don't appreciate how talented Don Anderson was. I, I agree. I mean, boy, when you see him, he does a, 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 you've seen the video. Maybe I saw it through you, actually. Yeah, probably. yeah, I, I, I transferred it. radio station. Yeah, I transferred it for him, yeah. Haven. Yeah. Oh, he is great. Yeah. Yeah, man, is he good? Yeah. And uh, you know, made me really jealous to listen to how good he, you know, he 
put that out. That was just impressive. Oh yeah, yeah. Because I mean, back in the eighties, that was actually pretty a pretty impressive video. I thought. So yeah, yeah. And the, the fact is, I mean, I didn't know that he had had a job offer to go to WOKY Milwaukee. Yeah, the mighty ninety two. I was like. Are you kidding me? That's a big time gig. But the funny thing about about Don is, is that it's like he really didn't dig the radio thing. No, <laughs> he didn't he really want to be the radio guy, and he had this tremendous pipes, and he, oh, he said, he uh, and and talented, yeah. and smart, yeah. I mean, and and we don't realize or don't give him probably as much credit as he deserves for having played such key roles in his time in Muskegon for what he did for radio, right, the right. people he brought into the industry. Yeah, because it was only seven years, basically, in, in Muskegon, because then he went to yeah. Grand Rapids. But, but yeah, TRU, we're talking uh, MUS, we're talking, I mean, he did... Uh, well, Tim Actor yeah. was part of that deal. He, oh, yeah, he got Tim, uh, Tim his first job in uh, yeah. doing radio over there. So. Yes. And Bob Moore. And, yeah. And, I mean, you just start going through the list of people he touched uh, in terms of what he did for their career. It was, right. It was remarkable. And then, of course, he had great success at WGRD. Right. Uh, tremendous talent. So moved, He moved right up to, to the top there. And he was, uh, like I say, but then he decided, just like a lot of people, that didn't like the way things were run and he wanted to run it himself. So he bought his own station. Well, and that was successful for 15 years. So that's not yeah, bad. He did really well. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, our radio station um, that we built up in northern Wisconsin, my partners and I, it was didn't go well for us. We had it for five years yeah. and sold it. But the sad part of it was from day one, we had a special configured antenna that we we're going to put on this tower site that was going to deliver <laughs> big chunks of that region. Right. Well, turns out, long story real short, the person who leased us the tower space for the antenna Yeah. Had no right to do that. Oh, okay. It turned out that it was owned by the U.S. Forest Service, <laughs> who would only allow an AM antenna, not an FM. Okay. Because they had a signal repeater for emergency purposes to inform campers in the region that there could be something significant they need yeah. to be aware of. Because he didn't read their contract, he leased it to us. We spent 10000 bucks on that antenna that was junk. Yeah. We couldn't use it after yeah. that. Yeah. And then the radio station had to relocate to a lesser tower yeah. site that was not good, and we lost a lot of the coverage, and then we had all kinds of problems. Well, We're lucky we sold it for what we had invested. Well, it's just like with the with the oldies, the, I don't know, third or fourth time I worked there. <laughs> yeah. um, when they were over on Lakedon Street, uh, oh, yeah. uh, that's when uh, – the guy that owned it was uh, Carson. Of, was he out of Chicago? Van Car, yeah, Van yeah. Carson, yeah. Oh gosh, and he was quite the character. Oh yeah, everybody, I, there's a lot of stories about him. <laughs> but uh, yeah, because he ended up going in the repeater business and putting us out of business. But anyway, um, he wanted this antenna, which is right next door to my house here. That at the time it was the Bear, a country station that we we ran. It was an automated country station called the Bear. Okay, and. I mean, it's been many, many, many things. But anyway, the, he, he wanted it to make it to Muskegon. Well, it never did. It made it basically Whitehall, and then you kind of lose it before you get to North Muskegon, you know. Oh, gotcha. And you, you're lucky if you got it in Montague, you know. It sure. just was, it was never much of a station. And that was the first station I ever worked at. So anyway, yeah. so I had like maybe two listeners. I remember I my one person used to call all the time was Lynn Quinn, and she worked at a bank, you know, over okay. here. And that was probably the only person that ever called. So, <laughs> But anyway, long story short here is uh, that he wanted that station to go somewhere. So Bob Bob Bolton, who has passed, uh, the general manager at, at the time at the oldies, he decided to hire this guy that he said was a genius, this engineer by the name of Ernest. And uh, I don't know what his last name was. He, was, he, was, he looked like Einstein. He had the bald head and his hair was like all bushed out on the side, you know, and and so he was going to, he, him and his partner came up with this, this tremendous idea to hook this antenna up so it would go as far as, you know, Muskegon and past. It's going to work. Only going to cost him $10,000. Oh. So they put the $10,000 into it. My son and another guy were hired to cut the bush back to, to, for a ground wire. What they did was put this ground wire on the railroad tracks that were behind 
his tower okay. to try to ground it out to do this whole special thing that he was doing. Anyway, long story, long story longer, I guess. We did it and did all this money, spent all this money, did all this stuff, and it didn't make it any farther than yeah. North Muskegon. And the funny thing is, that's also the station that when we were doing Talk and Tunes later, um, we were broadcasting on both Eagle 97 and the Bayer or whatever it was called then, just Eagle 97, you know, microwaved. Right. And somebody called us from Alaska. <laughs> It said they hear us in Alaska. No kidding. Yeah. So, so the signal skipped the, up there. The signal right? bounced all the way to Alaska. Oh, I love it. So, it, so it, it didn't go to Muskegon, but hey, we made it to Alaska. So there you That's go. That's great. <laughs> That's great. So as far as I'm concerned, he spent a good $10,000. You know, and we made it all the way to Alaska. So there you go. You know, speaking, you know, we talk about strength of a radio station. I was shocked to read. When they were doing this piece on Landecker, I mentioned earlier, yeah, John Records Landecker. Records, by the way, apparently truly was his middle name. Huh. He always said that, but I guess it really was. Records? Uh, yeah, it turned out that it was a last name in a generation or two previous. Oh, okay. And they'd actually named him John Records, last, somebody, a last name related to him, uh, Landecker. But anyway, he apparently at WLS which was an AM clear channel station, right? Not the ownership, but back in the days when yeah, yeah. AM radio was clear channel designated. Right, right. They had what? Uh, do you remember, Oscar, was it 35 AM clear channel stations right. throughout the U.S., something like that? But they were the high power ones. But yeah, yeah. 50,000 50, watts. 50,000 watts, yeah. And they said that his show went to 38 states at night. Wow. And that he had 5 million yeah. listeners yeah. at night. Yeah, ampli man, amplitude you, modulated, man. You, that thing can bounce everywhere. Oh, that's killer. Yeah, yeah. That's killer. Now, wasn't Wolfman Jack, he was out of Mexico. Yeah. And he was, was that station 100,000? Is that what it was? I don't know. They said know, it went right up the West Coast. I heard the story, but like I say, WL, WLS, uh, the one that, that Bob said he worked at uh, in New York. Um, oh. Yeah, uh, where Tom Shannon worked. Uh, was that WCBS? No, no. But AM, it, uh, w, uh, was it WINS, the news station? It, anyway. Yeah. The, the point is, is that uh, I guess he used to work there, b bouncing there every once in a while, too. So it was like he, he was like all over the place, I guess. Yeah. Cause, uh, it's amazing when you look at these guys and yeah. what they did. I thought Don Anderson's comment about not accepting the job at Waukee, I didn't. I wasn't interested in the golden microphone. Yeah, yeah. I thought, that's brilliantly said. <laughs> yeah. Got a lot of respect for Don. He's oh, yeah, me too. Terrific, terrific. I'm, I'm so glad I got to know him because, I mean, he, him and I are good good buddies now. And it's yep. it's, uh, it's it's kind of a, a sad that uh, we didn't get to know each other 30 years ago. You know, him and I always talk. We would... Uh, we would do our own little morning show if we could, you know. Oh, yeah. You guys have some would fun. Have had a ball. You would have had a ball, yeah. Yeah. But, uh, and fun same, stuff. well, same with John, uh, you know, same with John over there. He, had, yep. he was a, a great talent. I didn't get to know him as long as I would like to. But uh, anyway, hey, now I'm getting to know you, right, Leonard? Yeah, same, Oscar. <laughs> it's been great. Seriously. So. I've enjoyed it. Yeah, it's been fun to get together and do some stuff. Right. Really cool. So actually. let's let's do some more. Absolutely. All right. Thank you, sir. You bet. Thanks for the invitation. Talking tunes. And